Well, morning. Um, hope you've had a, a good week uh, since we've met last. I uh, pray that uh, you'll spend this time with us as we uh, look a bit into the Bible. Uh, maybe something a bit different, so to speak, this morning. We're starting a, a new series, having finished Ephesians last week. I um, spent just over two years looking at Ephesians. Uh, we're starting something new, so uh, we pray that God will uh, use this time to to teach us, and to encourage us, and to show us something of his glory, and of his might, and of his faithfulness. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to read from uh, the Bible. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for all your blessing. We thank you for your word, for the Bible that you've given us, that is in our own language, that we can read. And we just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit, as we read it, will open our eyes to understand what you want to speak to us about. That as we read from the Old Testament today, that you will uh, give us gospel eyes, uh, help us to, to learn something of you. And Father, as we come before you in prayer, we're, we're mindful of the situation we're in because we're meeting like this uh, over, the, uh, over YouTube and over the internet because we can't meet together because of the, the social isolation with the pandemic. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that you are sovereign. Lord, we don't really understand everything that's going on in our world, but we thank you that you do. Uh, and that you know and that you love us and that you care for us. Father, we, we pray for those who are really struggling today uh, because of what's happening. For those who are struggling with isolation. For those who are lonely. For those who are perhaps unwell. For those who are suffering from this virus. Lord, we commit them into your care. For those who are who are caring for them, for the, the NHS, for all the, uh, the carers around this world, Lord, all those who are, are seeking to, to help others. We, we thank you for them. We thank you for their work. We thank you for their dedication. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you will be with them and their families, Lord, and encourage them as you encourage us. And Lord, we pray for those in authority. We pray for the Prime Minister and the Cabinet and, and all the MPs and local councillors. We thank you for them and Lord we pray that you will give them wisdom uh, to know how best to, to deal with this ongoing situation. Lord we, we want your name to be glorified, we want your name to be lifted high. We come to you Heavenly Father as the, the one who knows the beginning from the end, the one who is sovereign. And so Lord we cry out to you that you will have mercy upon us, that you will have mercy upon our land and upon your world. And Lord that out of this pandemic with so many people ill, so many people dying, that we will see good come out of it, that we will see people turning from their sinful ways and turning to you, uh, the one who saves, the one who redeems, the faithful one. So we pray now, we commit this service to you, uh, that you will help us and that you'll be with us and that you'll bless us as we read and look into your word together. Amen. So let's continue, shall we, as we look into God's word. And I'm going to read some verses from Genesis, and Genesis chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 9. And in the Bible I'm reading from, it's called The Call of Abraham. So Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morath. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. 
So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tenth, tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. Amen. <clears throat> so as I, I mentioned earlier, um, we finished Ephesians and we're coming to uh, the start of a new series that we want to spend the next, I was going to say a few Sundays, probably quite a lot of Sundays, looking at together, if Ephesians was anything to go by. And as I was preparing and thinking about this particular series and what we were going to study, it came with real mixed emotions. Yeah. As, as I prepared to start preaching a, a new series, there's such excitement. What's God going to show us? What journey is God going to take us on? But perhaps mixed emotions too. Weary of the challenges that will lie ahead as we... We look and study God's word together. And just, I'm just putting it out there, some, some full disclosure. The book I'm going to look at, we're going to look at together. Well, unless you haven't guessed it already, we're going to be looking at Joshua. And I've got to tell you, Joshua is one of my all-time biblical Bible favourites. Um, so much so that our first son and only son is called Joshua. Just to give you an idea of how much this guy means and how much God used him. So with all that in mind, let's start, shall we, on this exciting trip together, this journey as we look at the book of Joshua. So, so who was Joshua? What sort of guy was he? What did he do that was so spectacular? So a, a little bit of background. Well, Joshua's life was actually remarkable. Oh, it, it was filled with great adventure, it's filled with great excitement, it's, it's varied, successful, victorious in lots and lots of ways. He was known as, a, as a, a man of God, if you like. He had deep trust in God and in Numbers uh, we read that he was a man in whom the Spirit was. A man devoted to God. As a, as a young man, as a youth, he would have lived in Egypt, so he would have known the the tyranny and, and the slavery that the, the people of God had faced under Pharaoh at that time. And, and he, would have, he would have witnessed firsthand all the, all the plagues that came upon Egypt as, as Moses had this, I was going to say this battle, this debate, this discussion with, with Pharaoh over them leaving. He would have seen the, the miracles that God had uh, had done in, in rescuing and redeeming Israel, how he'd take them, taken them out of Egypt and how they crossed the Red Sea and, and how the Egyptian army had been defeated. All this would have been in his history, in his, his memory. On the Sinai Peninsula, it was Joshua who led the troops of Israel to victory over the Amalekites. Read about it in Exodus 17. It was Joshua, and he alone who was the one who, who accompanied Moses up the holy mountain when, when God gave the law in the form of tablets in Exodus 24. And it was, it was Joshua who, who stood at the, the tent uh, of meeting that Moses had set up before the tabernacle had been erected. He was there standing watch. Later on we will read that that Joshua, as a representative of his own tribe, tribe Ephraim, was, was one of the twelve spies, remember? Um, how Moses picked twelve spies and they went out to spy in Canaan to look over the land. And it was only Joshua uh, and uh, my other favourite, Caleb, the only ones who came back with a, know, with a message to say yes, even though they were big and they were strong, that with God's help they would, they would win. And... They should take possession of the land. Read about it in Numbers 14. And we read that because that didn't happen, the whole of that generation died out as they wandered through the, the desert for 40 years, condemned to die. We even read that, that Moses fell short of this ultimate goal of going into the, the promised land. And he was told to, to turn everything, if you like, 
to hand the leadership over to this guy, Joshua. And we read that God promised to, to be with Joshua, to guide Joshua, to strengthen Joshua in the task ahead. Just as he'd been with Moses, God told him that he would be with him. And so Joshua was, was God's chosen man to, if you like, complete the work that, that Moses had started and to, to establish Israel in the promised land. And to that, to that divine appointment, Joshua was faithful. He was faithful as a, as a leader of, of God's army. He was faithful in his administration of uh, God's division of the land, which we'll come on to uh, later on in our series. And he was God's spokesman for, for promoting Israel's covenant faithfulness. And in all, and in all our dealings that we read and see with Joshua, we see that actually he was a, oh, a striking Old Testament type, if you like, of Christ, a, a foreshadowing, just little glimpses that would be ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. Before we, in case that wasn't enough of an introduction, before we start, start looking at this book of Joshua, we have to understand where it sits in the biblical narrative. Where does it appear? Well, I, I suppose, simplistically, it's the sixth book of the Bible. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Nice and simple, nice and easy to find near the beginning. And I suppose you could argue it was the, the first book of the Bible not to be written by Moses. Remember, Moses was responsible for writing the, the first five books. Probably the book of Joshua is set in the, in the late Bronze Age, just for those of you who are, who are history buffs, around 1550 to, to 1200 BC. So a bit, bit of a long time ago. And I suppose that begs the question... Why are we even bothering looking at an Old Testament book? Well, we believe that it was written for a purpose. It was written for a purpose to, to its own audience in its day all those centuries ago. But also there are things that we can learn as God's people in the 21st century. So it's important that we study it too. No one really knows who wrote the book of Joshua. Not definitively, some think that Joshua was at least responsible for, for some of it. It would have been written either partly during, I was going to say during his reign, it may not be the right term, but during his lifetime. Um, and if not, shortly afterwards, there are little clues that tell us, like Joshua 6.25 states that, that Rahab, and we're going to come on to her in, in later times, she was the one who was saved from Jericho, it says, and she lived in Israel to this day. Which seems to suggest that as this book was being written, again you could say, if you don't understand, if you don't believe, then go and ask Rahab. She's still alive. She's there. So as I said, this is the, the sixth book of the Old Testament of the Bible. And the first five books of the Bible are called the, the Torah or the, the Pentateuch. And They've been building, if you like, all the way through those five books, up to this point, up until this point in Joshua, up until the, the entry into this promised land that God had promised. So to see Joshua in the light of the greatest story of the Bible, we just need to, to stand back and just take in the, the big picture before we start to, to zoom in, there you go, there's a comment we're aware of these days, aren't we? We're all zooming away like that. But before we zoom in, so we're really another quick overview. Um, not quite a, a crash course in the first five books of the Bible, but here we go, it's a bit of a roller coaster. Right in the very beginning, Book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, it makes it absolutely clear that God is absolutely sovereign and he brings about his purposes simply by speaking. 
Just read Genesis 1 and, and just see how many times it says, and God said, let there be. And then at the end of each of those sentences, and it was so. God spoke and the created world and universe as we know it came into being. God, this is the God who we love and this is the God who we, we obey and this is the God that we glorify in. And we read that he created the, the day and the night and the stars and the moon and the sun and the earth and, and everything in it. And we read that he created a, a garden, the Garden of Eden, this paradise, read about that in Genesis 2, as a, as a place for the first humans, Adam and Eve, whom he created to live. And the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve were special. They were special from all the other of God's creation because, the Bible says, they were created in God's image. They were created to have this special relationship with God, to, to walk with God and to, to enjoy fellowship and friendship with God. What a time that must have been. Perfect. Genesis 3 to 11 sees the whole of that just spiralling. We have, we have the account of the fall, Adam and Eve sinning and rebelling against God and how through those chapters that the sin just spirals, if you like, out of control. And the people become alienated from, from the land, from the place that they were given Adam and Eve, were thrown out of the garden, never to return. We find that they are at odds with one another. There's no longer that relationship between them. But not only that, there, there's no relationship with God now. A holy God cannot abide sin, and so that perfect relationship between man and woman and God is now broken. The relationship of blessing now occurs. And yet, and yet the purpose of God cannot be destroyed. And as we continue reading Genesis, we realise and we read that that those promises are reinstated, if you like, in, um, in being stated with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, the, the passage that I read from. And then the rest of the Genesis, we see the, the gradual growth of, of Abraham's family from a few to oh, a massive amount. And Genesis ends with, with Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. Exodus assumes the existence of Genesis because it picks up on the timeline, if you like. It starts with the death of Joseph and then it introduces us to this, this threat of extinction to, to God's people that's just hanging over them. They'd gone to Egypt and they'd um, prospered in Egypt, they'd multiplied in Egypt, so much so that they were now, in Pharaoh's eyes, becoming a threat to Egypt's way of life. And so he, he turned them to slaves and was looking to, to annihilate them. But it's here in, in Exodus we read of, of God's intervention on behalf of his people. And it's here also that we, we read of his, his confirmation of them as his people. Exodus ends... There you go, there's a big jump. Exodus ends with Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. Leviticus takes us further by reporting the events that happened at Mount Sinai. Both Exodus and, and the books of Leviticus show how the people are to live in, in relationship with God and with each other and with the wider world. And having been, been formed as a people and, and established in their relationship with God, the, the book of Numbers, the next book, takes them on a journey from Mount Sinai to the, the plains of Moab. To the fulfilment of God's promise. To, to near the land that God is going to give them. Deuteronomy, the next book, that prepares this, this new generation for, for entry and, and for life in the, in the promised land. And it completes the, the Torah, the, the Pentateuch ending, ending with Moses' speech on the plains of Moab and with Moses' death. 
not to enter the promised land. And then, and then the book of Joshua. This completes the, the part of the story, if you like. So what about the promise? What's it all about? What do you mean? Well, way back in Genesis, as I said earlier, Genesis chapter 12 and, and those verses, the first three, God, God makes a, a three-part promise to Abraham. Listen to this. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This, this call of, of Abraham is one of the, the most fundamental parts, passages of the whole Bible. It lays the, the very framework, if you like, for God's redemptive plan through the promises there. Of a, of a land, of a place, I will make you into a great nation. Of a, of a people, of descendants. And also of a, a worldwide blessing because of them. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And at, at various parts and various stages throughout this, this narrative, God repeats these, these aspects of his promises. In Exodus 6 and the, the call of Moses, all three promises are there. But there's a new element now. It's, a, it's an element by which God will fulfil his purposes. God's redeeming activity. God buying back his people from slavery. God saving. God saving his people. And despite the, the continual, continual failure of the people, say throughout the Old Testament, the promises still stand. Later on you'll read how, how people like the judges were, were there and how we see this circle of God's people just turning their back on God and moving further and further away from him. And how later on the, the prophets warn and, and they looked forward to the day when, when it would be fulfilled, these promises completely, forever. It's in this context, if you like, of God's creative and and saving purposes that the, the book of Joshua finds its place. And as we'll see over the next few weeks and months, the book of Joshua with opens with, with reminders and restatements of these great themes, these great promises, a, a place to live, a people to live there, and, and blessing to enjoy in relationship with God. The book of Joshua itself is split or can be split or commonly split into, into three parts. The, the first division, chapters 1 to 12, well, they focus on, on Israel's uh, victorious conquest of Canaan. How, how Joshua led Israel to a decisive battle over the Canaanites. And they, they start with the, the crossing of the Jordan and, and those initial victories at Jericho and Ahai and how these are followed by a covenant renewal ceremony in the, the vicinity of Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And we'll read and we'll look at how, how Joshua's major campaign against the alliance in the north and the south brought together this promised land. The second part of the book, chapters 12, uh, 13 to 22, will we'll deal with with Israel's tribal inheritances, how, how each of the tribes was alloco allocated their, their particular area of the promised land and how God was able to bless them. And then the third and the final division, if you like, are the, the last two chapters, chapters 23 and 24. And they close the book by, by giving attention to to Israel's covenant loyalty. How, how Israel's loyalty and 
disloyalty to the terms of God's covenant would, would shape their future. And it's these last two chapters of our book. They focus on, on two assemblies that Joshua held near the time of his death. The, the first was probably took place at Silo. It was a, a holy site, played a, a really important part in, in Joshua's day and, and later on in the period of the judges. And it closes with a, a final assembly at Shechem, the, the place where we read of that Abraham had built his first altar in the land of Canaan. And we read that, that all Israel gathered at these assemblies and, and Joshua just warned them. What would happen if they disobeyed God? Not to do it. And the book closes with, with Joshua leading the, the people of God in renewing their commitment to the, to the God and to him alone. How they, they vowed to reject all other gods. All the, the gods that were now going to be in the vicinity that they were going to take over. How they would reject them and stay and worship the one true God. And it's that very brief overview of Joshua that we're going to spend weeks, the next few weeks, looking at in more detail. So I suppose it's always great to sum things up. Uh, and if I was to, to sum up or ask to sum up um, Joshua, maybe in, not in a couple of words, that's almost impossible for a, somebody preaching, but maybe in a few sentences, how would I do it? Well, I think Joshua does it himself, or at least the book does. Listen to the words of Joshua 21 verse 45, because I believe this is the key to the book. This is the key that will unlock all the things that we're going to learn about, about God. It says this, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. All came to pass. If this is indeed the, the central theme of Joshua, I believe it is, then we're going to spend time just, just looking how, how that works out in practice. What did it mean for the people of Israel at that time? And what does it mean for us? What does it mean that God is faithful? What does it mean that not one of his good promises failed? What can we learn from the Old Testament? Well, lots. And we're going to see how the faithful God, the one who is faithful to Israel and to Joshua, is the same God who is faithful to us, who makes promises to us, who redeems us and has given us a relationship with him. We are now his people and we have a place where we'll be able to worship him here but also forever in heaven. So I hope you can join us as we, we go on our journey through Joshua. Let me pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that we read there. And Lord, even in this really short roller coaster ride, we pray, Lord, that people will be able to just grasp your goodness, your sovereignty, your might, your holiness, and your faithfulness that you show to your people then. And Lord, your, your redeeming nature that you showed to your people then. And your redeeming nature that you've shown to us in the Lord Jesus. Oh Lord, we just pray that this will be, become a reality to all those who don't yet know you. That they will turn to the Lord Jesus. And uh, put their trust in him. And enjoy the blessings and the faithfulness of you in your promises. Amen. Hope you join us. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel somewhere here.
be great to hear from you. Uh, look up our website, BethelBaptistLive.co.uk. Uh, the sermons and stuff are there as well. Um, and also you'll be able to contact us through the contact page. We look, hearing from, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.